Have you ever asked someone how they're doing? And they answered with the phrase, super busy. Many of us wear that busyness like a badge of honor. The busier we are, the more important we feel. But is busyness really how we want to live our lives? Maybe it's time to step back and reflect on what's most important. Maybe it's time to ask yourself, am I really focusing on what's essential? This is the WorkWell podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be here with you today to talk all things well-being. What I think, if I could put it this way, I think we've been conned mm. into, into thinking that if you do it all, you're going to get it all. And that's not true. Well, that, that's, if, if it is true, you just ignore everything else I say, <laughs> right? I'm here with Greg McKeon. Greg is the author of the best-selling book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. He is also the CEO of This Inc., a company whose mission is to assist people and organizations to spend 80% of their time on the vital few rather than on the trivial many. Essentialism is the disciplined pursuit of less but better. It's the antidote to a problem that everybody feels, which is feeling stretched too thin at work and at home, for being busy but not productive, for feeling like your day is being hijacked perpetually by other people's agenda. You're describing my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Well, it's not good. It's not necessarily good, but it's, it, it is how a lot of people feel now. Yeah. And so this is, this is in the zeitgeist. A lot of people listening to this know exactly what that challenge is, and Essentialism is is the, is, the, is is a solution to that, right. uh, and and it, it includes figuring out what's essential, eliminating what's not essential, and making it as easy as possible to do the things that matter most. So I think most people, including myself, have a fear of doing less makes you not as engaged, or a slacker, or not caring as much. Well, yes, I think I think the the I think for a lot of people, life is fast and full of opportunity. But there is a complication, which is that uh, uh, we think we have to do everything, right? And there there is a consequence to that, which is that we start to plateau in our progress because we're just making a little bit of progress in too many different directions. And so, what I think, if I could put it this way, I think we've been conned mm. into into thinking that if you do it all, you're going to get it all. And that's not true. Well, that, that's, if, if it is true, you just ignore everything else I say, <laughs> right? If, I mean, if it's working for people, I mean, I will say this. I talked to somebody recently. I said, how are you? When I first came to America, I'll say this. When I first came to America, I used to say, how are you? And people said, great. That was their answer. Great. It was fantastic. It was like they were saying, well, I'm American. Of course. <laughs> you know, I'm great. I love that optimism. Fantastic. 20 years later now, and when I ask people how they're doing now, what they say is busy. Mm -hmm. Busy. In fact, there's whole flavors of busy. I'm busy, busy. I'm great, but busy. I'm crazy, busy. I'm crazy, busy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a whole, you know, yeah. museum committed to all the different versions and pictures of, uh, of, of busyness that we have now. And, and, and so I, I was talking to this, as I say, this person, I'm so busy. She said, I'm sleeping on average four hours a night for the last two weeks. And uh, she, 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 she thought I'd be impressed she, because I think what she was saying, she didn't say it, but I th think she was saying, Greg, I hate to break it to you. I'm just a little more important than you are. <laughs> you know, I'm under such great demand. You see, I can only sleep four hours a night. But, uh, but, 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 and, and, and she was, I think it was like a badge of honor. Mm -hmm, of course. You know, yeah. I am so, I am so busy. And it's, it's look, it's marvelous how busy... And uh, I think busyness itself has, like, you know, maybe no value at all. Uh, I, I'm not advocating laziness either. Right. That, that's, that's a nonsense. If, you, if you're not doing anything, then, then okay, this book's not for you. Right. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is the other side of the equation. This is where you are working hard and you've given a lot and you're giving a lot and you want to break through to the next level, but you can't actually do more. And the attempt to try to do more is fatiguing, exhausting, stressful. So 
what actually happens isn't that you go get more. You're doing worse on the things. You do, that, you do worse at everything. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so this is, I mean, if you're four hours a night, I mean, I'm just riffing on this example of this person I spoke to, but if you're sleeping four hours a night, um, then you, you, you I, mean that, I mean, that is psychologically and physiologically the same as if you're drunk. Really? Yeah, it is. You're right. I mean, we would never say, you would never say, would you? I would never say, this employee has been so fantastic, the way they make decisions inebriated like that. <laughs> yeah, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't praise that. We, but, we, we say, but we do celebrate the person that stays up all night to get a project done. Yeah, that's right. That's what we do. Yeah. And, and when it becomes a dominant way of doing things, mm -hmm. the executive function of your brain is shutting down. So you're simply making worse choices. Yeah. And that means that you continue and perpetuate the, the sort of busyness without thinking that got you in that situation in the first place. And so what I say to anybody who says, well, uh, you know, I'm not sure if, this, uh, if I buy this whole thing, discipline, pursuit of less but better, is, well, keep doing what you're doing. Double down on it. Yeah. Don't sleep at all. Yeah. And see uh, how that works out See how you. that works out for you. I mean, if... Non-essentialism, the enemy of our story, is delivering on its promise. Um, that means that by doing more, you're getting better relationships, you're progressing in your career, you're making higher contribution, you're having more joy in that journey. Great! But I do mean, we, don't listen to me, keep do doing you, it! Do you think we falsely convince ourselves that that's true when it's really not? Well, I do think there's something in this pattern we're describing, this undisciplined pursuit of more, that seems to keep us so busy, we, we, we don't often pause. I think it's easier for people to face their phone than it is to face their life. So you think that technology has a lot to do with where we are today? I, I, think, that, I think that the problems I am... I, articulating in essentialism predate this last sort of 20 year extreme connectedness okay. but I think that all of those normal human tendencies to be distracted or to procrastinate or to or to feel stressed or to do too much are all exacerbated by this okay. this technology era has shifted us so far towards the non-essentialist way of living and has sold it so incessantly uh, and, and so I think that it I think that it has the power of relevance now because it's gone from being an issue to being either the issue or mm -hmm. certainly sort of top two or three issues right. as anxiety rates have now taken over in the mental health space mm -hmm. uh, surpassing depression but that's a really significant change in the human condition and I think that, that this is related to this endless interruption, the endless ch change. You know, anything can be changed so many times, constantly through a day. You know, I don't think humans are particularly good at this. But it all adds up to the same thing, which is that there's a basic con that's been going on. Right. So when you're on version 40 of your PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> yes. you should probably step back and say... That's enough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, you know, that's an example. You can, technology, well, technology promises endlessly something that it doesn't deliver. And I'm not a Luddite, I'm not anti-technology, but so often it promises. I mean, you watch, you, we do a game with my children and we, we, uh, we, we look at, you know, there's an advertisement on and I, and I will say, and they actually quite enjoy the game, but okay, what is being sold and what is really being sold? You know, okay, well, here is this new time-saving technology. That's what's being sold. But what's really being sold is you'll get your, you'll have a happy life. You'll have time to play in the backyard with your kids. You're going to make, you know, memories together. I mean, that's the promise. Right. But that isn't being delivered. Why is it not being delivered? Because there's a dominant assumption underneath uh, that, that, we, that we have to address first. The assumption that if I do more and more and more. I will get more and more life. And that isn't, that isn't what happens. You know, it turns out, to be, uh, it turns out to be a false assumption. I mean, we, we used to call that a lie. You know, it's, it's, it's a lie. It doesn't deliver that. And so uh, of necessity, we should look for 
a, a way out of that madness. And, and I'm arguing that the type of leader needed in this particular reality is to become an essentialist. So take me on the journey of how you became interested in this topic. There was a, there was a, a dual um, experience. I was working with Silicon Valley companies and noticed this predictable pattern. And so what I was observing professionally is the Silicon Valley companies, early days they would have clarity, led to success, led to options. And those options, if they weren't addressed correctly, l led to the undisciplined pursuit of more. And so the, 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 there's a paradox there because it undermines the very things that led to success in the first place. Mm. Success can in fact become a catalyst for failure. And, and then that connected with something that happened personally. I get an email from a colleague at the time says, uh, you know, Friday between one and two would be a very bad time for uh, your wife, Anna, to have a baby. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Can you schedule it? <laughs> so we're in the hospital Thursday night. Our daughter's born Thursday night. And Friday morning we're there. And, you know, and, and I am quintessential non-essentialist at this moment how can I do both the logic is if you do both you keep everybody happy mm -hmm. you know if I can just if I can just leave quickly enough and be very efficient about this then I can quickly go to this meeting and, I, and everybody knows when they hear that story that's so you, you're making a fool's bargain mm -hmm. you know that you're violating something more important for something less important you're saying you're going to get both, but you're not going to get either. Right. The, the look on the faces of these people didn't evince the sort of confidence that I'd made a good choice. You know, I, I, I violated something essential, something non-essential. And what I learned was the simplest of lessons, which is if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. Yep. And so you know, that, was, that was really, in hindsight, a defining moment in in identifying what I wanted to you know give you know, perhaps the rest of my professional life to to that issue why is it we make the choices we make why do we violate I think most people listening to this know that kind of moment I'm talking mm -hmm. about where they they did do something less important instead of something more important and there's a non-trivial question to understand why that is and it's a mission worth pursuing to work out how to reverse that and change that and make that different. I think anybody listening can definitely get behind this idea of doing less better, but that's hard. I mean, how do you, how do you actually go about that? Yeah, well, you see, here's the thing, you see, I've been thinking a lot about what you just said. It's exactly the language you just gave. Um, and this idea that the essentials are hard. It's a story we're telling And ourselves. the non-essentials are easy. <laughs> I, I think it is a story, and that story is part of actual systems and structures. So there's assumptions, a system, structures, all that make it actually true that essentials are hard for people and non-essentials are easy. And also they believe that it is true. And if you believe that it is true, it's like, you know, somebody puts up a slide, it's got 500 words on it. You don't read the first 200 and then give up. You do the pre-scan, you go, oh, I'm never going to read that. <laughs> right? you know, that's, that's, that's too much. And that's what I think happens with a lot of the essentials in our lives. We say, have a, have a look at that. Is it? No, I'm never going to do that. That's just too much. I can't do that today. I'll, I'll do that later. And so a combination of the assumption that it's going to be hard, plus we haven't figured out lives in such a way that it becomes easy mm -hmm. means that we don't do it and so we we we, we get caught between this false dichotomy uh, between things that are important but overwhelming on the one hand and things that are easy and pointless on the other and as we face decision fatigue by 11 o'clock in the morning we we just slip without really ever meaning to into the pointless but easy things mm. What the argument I'm trying to make is that it, is, it doesn't have to be as hard as we think it will be. And, 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 that's, and I, here's what I think we should do. I could, I could talk about how to do it, you know, talk about how we ride a bike right, for a long time, but I think, I think we should just apply essentialism right now with you 
Are you game for that? That's I'm, the question. I I think I'm game for that. Let's try it and see. Are you, are you feeling nervous? Are you feeling, <laughs> feeling nervous about it? I'm very nervous. Why are you nervous? What's nervous about this? I, because I don't know that I've figured this out in my own life. Right, because it's real. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's just a great, it's a great place for us to be, begin because we're all, we're all in that category. Um, there are people who are lost. Mm-hmm. And then there are people who know they are lost. Hmm. And to be in the second category is really important. I mean, that's, that's like takes courage to admit it, to face it. And it's also, of course, the beginning of the right journey. If, you, if, if I'm lost in a car, yeah, pre-GPS, if I'm lost <laughs> and, I don't, and, I, and I don't admit that I'm lost, then I'm never going to figure this out. Because if I'm lost and I admit it, well, you know what to do. Stop, ask directions, you get back on track. Okay, so with that as context, I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Okay. Very simple. Okay. Give me first thoughts as I ask them, right? So what is something right now in your life that is essential that you're underinvesting in? First thoughts. My family. Yeah. Okay, tell me a little more about that. What, what does that mean? When you say family, there's other things you're thinking of with that. What? Well, I think that many of us, I mean, certainly me, I, we assume that family is always going to be there. Right. So we make other decisions and, you know, assume that they're going to be okay with it. And, you know, and, and a lot of times they are, right? But, but you, you, you're saying that w- when you face those trade-off moments, there are times and maybe even repeated times of, of habit even of saying, okay, this, I'll keep on putting work first because th- their commitment is longer term so it's an okay trade-off. But, but what you're saying is the reason you mention this is some concern about it. Mm-hmm. What's the concern for you? Um, if I'm showing up as my best for them. Mm-hmm. I mean, my, my job is as the chief well-being officer for Deloitte. So right. I, you know, I, I also have to serve as that role model, right? That I'm showing up for my family and I'm also showing up for the job that I'm doing. You feel... In addition to the personal desire to have the kinds of relationships you want with your family, the responsibility to model yeah. that this life is possible, that, you, that, the, that wellness isn't just a tagline, that it can be done. Right. And so when you feel, well, maybe I'm, I am not doing that, there's a double whammy reason to, 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 to try and re-examine this. Absolutely. You got it. Um, help me understand a little more about this, if you don't mind. What, what does success look like for you in this family area? How would you know that this was not on your, this wasn't an underinvested area for you? Um, I think there are times when I, feel as if I should be more engaged with the people that I'm with. Mm. You know, my head is thinking about 16 other things and I'm just not as present as I would like to be. In terms of time, you're there. Right. But in terms of presence, you don't feel like you're fully there. Correct. And this isn't feedback they've given to me. This is... This it's is, you. Yeah, it's me. Yeah. But yourself, you feel... Too often I'm there, but really my mind is somewhere else. Yeah. So help me identify the delta. Like what shift would make you feel like I've made meaningful progress in, in actually improving this? Maybe, I mean, an hour, I mean, okay. an hour a day. I don't, you know. Okay, and what would that look like for you? Let's try and make that as, as tangible as possible. So is it an hour, okay, at dinner time, I'm with them for an hour and no technology and no, I don't know, if there's no talk about work, I don't know what, whether that's <laughs> no even the No technology, no TV, just talking about how life's going, what's going on, what's on your mind. Check in, yeah, yeah. catch up. Yeah. Planning uh, our next vacation, talking about hopes and dreams. Talking about family mm-hmm. with family. Mm-hmm. Not w- talking about work with family, that's important, but you're saying really specifically talking about us 
what we want to do and invested in each other. That's what you're saying. Yes. Um, how much do you think you're doing that right now? I would say, you know, a few days a week for sure. Okay. Yeah. So give me numbers. Three, three days a week, four days a week. What, what you want is to be at? Seven days a week. Hour a day, totally focused, phones away, yours and everyone else's. And that feels, I mean, that's seven hours a week out of. 168. Know. Yeah. <laughs> I should be able to accomplish that. <laughs> yes, but, but I, don't wanna, I don't want to undermine the challenge of it either. I, do, I agree. I think, you, I think should, yes, you should be able to, this can be done. But I also understand how much pressure actually is on us to not live that way. And the reason that the essentials in our life are not easy is because we haven't built a system to make them easy. All right, we're going to get there. All right, let me ask you now the other side of this question. Are you still game? I'm still game. Other side of the equation is this. So that was like, le that was like phase one. It's the, uh, the hardest part of it. Phase one is what is essential? Well, that's what we've been talking about. What matters? Why does it matter? What does success look like? And so on. Let's get concrete. And we, we've identified this. Now, on the other side of the question is what, is, what, what are things that are less essential that you're over-investing in? First thoughts. It doesn't have to be one thing. It could be a few things. But be honest, anything. Non-essential or just less essential that you're over-investing. Time on the internet. Time on the internet, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. what's, what's your, what are your guilty places of choice? I, I mean, I, social media, certainly. Yeah. I just, you know, I'm definitely guilty of the endless scroll and just yeah. keep scrolling and because it's, it's mindless. Yeah. Well, because we want, we, we want an escape. Yeah. And whether it's that escape for the people listening or some other escape, we want it to be rejuvenating. We want headspace and so on. But it's not. But it's not. It's part of the con. It doesn't actually deliver on its promise. If you had to add up the amount of time you are on social media or in what, what we'll call less than productive internet time. I, I don't know. I'm afraid to look at my phone and find I, that out. <laughs> I, 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 I looked recently, well, not so recently, a few months ago. And, uh, and I was so surprised at how much time I, I was spending in news articles, just alone, just news. And I thought, this is... This is this cannot be sensible to use this precious time on this. You know, and, and, so, and so I identified that. I'm sure I was spending an hour a day doing that. Um, and so, okay, so we've identified something. Well, that was a little bit magical because we were looking for not even an hour a day. We were looking for an extra sort of three or four hours a day, depending on the week. That's the delta we're looking for. And you've identified something that is relatively unimportant to you, but is habitual now and is easy mm -hmm. and so on. So we're moving on to the third and final stage. How can we make it easy to do what you've identified as essential and hard to do what you've identified as non-essential? That's it. Now that's an easy, as a, it's not so easy, right? To do that, we have to do that. Right. So what could you do to make, well, let's start with the non-essentials. What could we do to make the non-essentials a little bit harder to do? Delete them from my device. Yeah, that's right. So uh, uh, digital essentialism. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely have a big advocate for this. Just take every single app on your phone and delete it. <laughs> and then you bring them back one by one as it serves your purposes. Mm. So there are apps. I've, there, are pl there are not plenty. There are a, a select set of apps that I find very useful. Some of them when I'm traveling. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I find it much easier than the alternative. And, and so I have those on my phone. This is, this is great. We're using it for our own purposes. So you could eliminate them all. Good. That, enough that friction would make it a little harder. That we could prepare quite easily a conversation to have with your family uh, after this conversation. And you simply say, look, I've, I, I, you are more important to me than this nonsense. But... It's, I'm just in this habit, so I need your help. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I need your help just to be able to get into this new habit, this new routine. So now you have social positive peer pressure in your favor. So on the flip side, I yeah. mean, one of the ideas that I have is schedule the time like you would 
any other meeting that's really important to you. That's right. And stick to it. Yeah, and and a a little plug here for for an idea that's, I think, really important, which is the difference between scheduling and routinizing. Mm. Scheduling, you have to keep doing it. You think about it this week, am I going to do it? Am I going to do it? And there's all cognitive costs. Every time you schedule it, you have to decide and think about it. When am I going to do it? What meetings do I have? An alternative way, and it's a little more work up front, but you really think through your routines and schedules and you say, okay, this is when I'm going to be at dinner at 6 p.m. every night, other than when I'm traveling, maybe. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, something that's realistic. You know, if you don't have an hour. I was going to say. Unplugged, you don't have a life. Right. Right. I mean, this is. I mean, this shouldn't be that hard to accomplish. but it. uh, For many of us, it feels like it is. Well, that's because the people that have been building the systems in our lives are incentivized to keep us plugged in all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's in their that's in their interests. Yeah. And that doesn't make them evil, but it does mean that that they have outsourced to us the responsibility to create these kinds of space and experience because they've they've succeeded so so well at, uh, at at making their tools ubiquitous. For us, so how confident do you feel you could do that? Like, leaving right now, how confident are you right now? Honestly, do you feel like I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to do this? It's 100 percent, or is it 50 percent? I don't know. It's just so. In all transparency, it's yeah. this is an ongoing problem. So I've done it before <laughs> successfully, and yes. then you know, old habits die hard, right? <laughs> So, so it's been done before. It's not unprecedented. There's plenty of other people that, that can do it, right? So I feel pretty confident about it. So let's, let's do a couple more things to at least illustrate. That do I we not can, sound confident? <laughs> well, well, no, the, my, the question was a, it was a genuine question because the goal with this third step is to keep building our system until eventually the ideal scenario is that there's no scenario in which we won't do it. Mm. It's like the opposite. It's not like, well, in a best case scenario, in a pretty good way, I'll do it. It's like, no, that, that, this has now been changed. It's not an option. Yeah. This is just going to happen because all the incentives have been aligned, because all of the people involved have been aligned. Challenge accepted. Yeah, good. A social contract, one more idea. Social contract where you actually write up everything we just talked about in specific detail and you sign it, spouse signs it, whoever some other witness signs it and it sounds silly i mean i know i know how it sounds no but these things work I they mean, do work science has proved yes that they, they work. do yeah. because you're making a public commitment and we're very uh, we, we we have a deep psychological need to be consistent with what we're saying and, and actively stating publicly yeah. and so you just you we don't have to worry about why that is the case we just use these things to our advantage to building a life where the essential things become the default things and then and then Years and years go by, and we have actually lived a life that really mattered, where we were centered in the things that really matter. Mm. That's it. It's ex- we did three things. We explored, eliminated, and executed. That was what the three steps are. We explored what was essential. We figured out what was non-essential that we could eliminate. And we built a system to make it as routine and easy as possible to follow through on the things that are essential. How do you feel right now? I feel um, vulnerable. Do you? Yeah. But I feel good. I mean, I think you have brought something, something that's kind of a continual challenge for me. And, you know, I mean, I, I talk about it openly. I talk about it regularly, but I need to, I need to do something different with it. Well, and, and you're doing something even in being open and being vulnerable about it. My goodness, I'm not perfect at this. I live in the real world. I'm married to Anna, amazing, four children. Wow. Not very essentialist of me. <laughs> I'm just, joking, just joking, just joking, just joking. But uh, but 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 the 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 reward for this kind of wrestling is that we start to actually have a life that step by step really is in alignment with what we state is our highest priority and, and reward in life. Yeah. So do I get to ask you questions yeah. again now? Yeah, you, 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 you get to... Re- <laughs> I, I passed. You, get to, you, you did superbly well. In your view, applying these principles, the principles of essentialism, how does that impact personal and, I guess, team well-being? I, uh, I, w- w- one of the uh, examples in the book is of a, of a mm-hmm. superbly successful entrepreneur, uh, professional who... 
uh, it was traveling all over the world, a very successful business, uh, had a great positive impact in the world. I mean, it just doing great things. But then after all this travel, he was starting to deplete his, uh, his reserves, his deep resources. I remember, I remember him telling me that, that in the middle of the night one time, he just wakes up like there'd been a gunshot that had gone off. And he's like, what, what happened? He sits up in bed. He looks around. The whole family's asleep. Everything's silent. And, uh, and he goes, oh, uh, something weird is up. Uh, goes back to sleep. And then it happens again. And then it happens in the middle of the day to him. And he goes to the doctor. He's like, what is going on? And after this, this work, one of the things the doctor concludes, is, you, are just, you have burned yourself out. Mm-hmm. You, have burned, you are burned out. And uh, of course, he didn't want to admit that. But then what I think is great, that story, is he says, he says, well, like a p- true uh, overachiever, I said, I said, look, you know, I'll, fine, what do I need to do? He said, the doctor said, well, go home, sleep for six weeks, you know, go, go rest, <laughs> relax, you know. And he, he, said, he said, oh, you watch me, I'll do this in two. Because that's what an overachiever would say, wouldn't he? Right, right. I'm going to heal fast. I'm going to do this sprint. I'm going to sprint to Elmas. Uh, and he said that he went home and he, he did start to sleep. And he, he, said, he said he was like sleeping 16 hours a day. He just suddenly crashed. He, after two weeks, he goes back to the doctor. He says, okay, I get it, right? I am, this is, I'm, I'm use, this is useless now. And so it took him years of recovery, as it turns out, mm-hmm. because he had burned so deeply uh, these deep resources. And, and when he was trying to make sense of this whole experience, he summarized his lesson in three words, what he shared with me and, and, and a lot of other, uh, you know, of his peers, and he said, "Here's the lesson: protect the asset." Mm. And you, you, you are the only resource. I mean, it's a very business way of saying it, I suppose, but <laughs> the only resource through which you can impact anything else. Yeah. There's only one you. There's only one you, yeah. and. And you, you, you don't want to just go through life. You want to be able to experience it, have a rich experience, have lived the life in color, not in black and white, yeah. not to be exhausted all the time, not to be making decisions from that place of fatigue and burnout where relationships start to feel like a pain, mm-hmm. uh, where, 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 we, where we resent sort of everything and every, anything coming our way because we're so deep down death tired. And so I think that essentialism is, is, is well, certainly a friend of wellness, but it, I, I would say it's, it's a path. It's the wellness. path. Yeah. And I don't know of any other path that actually delivers on this because, because what we're trying to do is to actually build a life around what matters, not just to retire from life, not just, it's not do less for the sake of less. Right. It's doing less but better. It's doing you know, a disciplined pursuit of the essential rather than an undisciplined pursuit of the non-essential. I'm so grateful Greg could be with us today. Thank you to our producers and to you, our listeners. You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you would like to hear on the WorkWell podcast series, or maybe a story you'd like to share, reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jennifer Fisher or on Twitter at JenFish23. We're always open to recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well.